Well, good morning and welcome to our online service here from Ballyhome Presbyterian Church. It's lovely to have you today and we pray God's blessing upon you as you share with us this morning. Just a couple of announcements before we enter into our worship. First of all, today's the last opportunity to give at church for Storehouse. Um, the next opportunity will be on Monday the 4th of January next year and that being the first Monday of the month. However, you still can collect for Storehouse in your own home if you're doing the reverse advent calendar, uh, the little box, and you just put one item in a day, it's something simple like a can of beans or something, and then by the time we get to the 24th, you have a whole uh, hamper which we can then collect and give to Storehouse in uh, January, and they can distribute from there. On Wednesday next, the 16th of December, we're having an extra carol service here in church. That's at 7 p.m., now, it is aimed, not exclusively, but it is aimed towards families with children, and the style of the service will um, reflect that. Um, for families who may not feel able to come to the, the larger service here on the 20th, uh, where perhaps there's a lot of older folk around and they don't want their kids uh, running around and, and potentially mingling among uh, the older folks uh, for safety reasons. Our idea is that we create an opportunity for as many people as possible to get to a carol service. So we would be asking whichever one you choose to go to, that's the one you go to, that we don't have people coming along to both services and thereby maybe at one of them taking up a space for someone else. So uh, if you pick either uh, Wednesday the 16th or Sunday the 20th. Then our carols by candlelight will be next Sunday evening uh, at 6 p.m. here in church. Um, we hope to create as much a, a traditional carol service feel as we possibly can. Um, although to allow us to use the church on the evening without necessitating a, an extensive clean during the day, the service next Sunday will only be online. There will be no morning service in the church building next Sunday morning. The church will be used on Sunday evening for the carol service at 6 p.m. That also is going to apply to the following Sunday, the 27th of December. Uh, the 11 a.m. service will be again online because we have a service on Christmas morning and the 72 hours haven't elapsed and it would necessitate a full clean and somebody having to do that uh, on Christmas Day or Boxing Day. And uh, um, I think there's a story about someone who made people work on Christmas Day and Boxing Day to do with bah humbug, so we'll not be doing that. Could we also highlight the importance of our givings to church as the end of the year approaches? With church services having been suspended for a significant portion of the year, understandably, our givings have taken a hit. And we want to highlight two funds in particular. First of all, the United Appeal. Now, the United Appeal is uh, the funds that we send to the central funds up in Church House to facilitate the wider ministry of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland uh, that is conducted within Ireland and also overseas. And the other fund is the Free Will Offering, which enables our work here in Ballyhome, including the paying of bills. The fact of the matter is most of our major expenses have continued uninterrupted all the way through the year. And so your consideration towards uh, these two funds, the United Appeal and the Free Will Offering, would be much appreciated. We're also collecting any used stamps that you've got on your Christmas cards or letters that you receive at this time of the year. Uh, we're collecting them again and also any old pairs of glasses that you no longer need, that your eyes have since, like mine, gone further down the, the pecking order and the glasses that you have uh, don't work anymore. Uh, so you can bring your old ones and there'll be a box for stamps and also a box for glasses out on the porch for people to drop their glasses and stamps into as they leave church. Now I realise the next two Sundays we're actually not going to be here, so those boxes are going to be there until mid-January uh, to allow people to do that. And I reckon that's all our announcements for today. We worship God together. We've been tracing God's plan of salvation through the history of the Old Testament over the past number of weeks, and today we arrive at the prophets who in the midst of tough, tough messages also spoke very, very powerful words of hope looking to the future. Words that highlighted a particular individual, a special rescuer, a messiah, a king, 
who was going to come, who would reign on David's throne, establishing and upholding it and his kingdom with justice and righteousness, and that he would do that forever. Today, Isaiah points to this great king and shockingly identifies him as a newborn baby, a little boy, a human child. But his humanity means that he will be a king who understands you and me. He will understand us and, and how we are and the way we are. Psalm 139 says, Lord, you have examined me and you know me. You know everything I do. From far away, you understand all my thoughts. It's wonderful that we have a Lord who understands us, understands our lives, understands what we're going through, understands where we're coming from when we pray to him. And so we want to pray to him and worship him this morning in our service. The first song that we're going to sing is maybe the first carol of this year, and it is In the Bleak Midwinter. Now, let us join together in prayer. This morning, Lord, in our worship, we proclaim and acknowledge you as the mighty God, the maker of all that is, the author of life, the origin of love, the embodiment of grace, the saviour of humanity. In highest heaven, you are exalted and glorified because you are the holy God in whom there is no wrong, and who is full of mercy and is just and true in every way. 
We join today with the citizens of heaven in praising your name and giving you the glory that you are worthy of. We're sorry, Lord, when we do not approach you as God, when we diminish your glory and treat you more like an impressive person, when in truth you are above and beyond us in every way. We're sorry when we do not recognize you as mighty God and we criticize you because your ways do not fit in with ours, when in truth you are perfect and just in all your ways, being faithful and true, you do what is right and fair. And we're sorry, Lord, when we do not receive Christ as Saviour and push on determinedly in our own ways, when in truth Jesus gave everything for us, setting aside the glory of heaven and entering humanity as a newborn, totally reliant upon a young couple and growing in this life with all its joys and sorrows to bring the wonderful news of God's grace and mercy only for him to be attacked and abused and killed, all willingly knowing that his death would free us from sin's curse and open to us the way to reconciliation with God. We praise you, Lord Jesus, that you know us, for you are intimately acquainted with all our ways. You understand us from every angle in life. You understand and can empathize with us because you have walked in our shoes. You have kept the appointments that we keep. You've been through what we go through. You've been through the whole range of emotions. And you've been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet, you remained without sin. Therefore, as the perfect human king, you can truly stand in our place. And you have. With that understanding and power and authority, Come and minister to us today, Lord. Speak to us. Help us to hear your voice. And may we respond in faith. And this we pray in your precious name. Amen. Now, boys and girls, Heather's going to come with uh, your talk for today. And then after that, our reading from Isaiah chapter 9 is going to be brought for us by Audrey Titterington. Nativity to go. It's a very special nativity service nativity for this service. Christmas. Mm -hmm. We won't be meeting in church on the Sunday morning because of our carols by candlelight on Sunday evening. So our nativity is a nativity to go. Is it for? For everyone. Not just children. No, it's for everyone. Boys and girls, teenagers, bigger people, even grandmas and grandpas. What if I don't know the words? That won't matter. Just use the script to guide you as you take your pictures or video your actions. On the day, someone else can read the part. Do I wear? Well, dressing gowns, tea towels and ties, of course. Or a costume if you have one. Where will we film it? You can do it at home or outside. If I don't do it, no one will care. Well, you might think that. But it's all for Jesus to show our worship and our love this Christmas. He will care. He doesn't need toys or presents to celebrate his birthday, just to know how much we love him. And it's also for our church family. They will care. A chance for us to connect again, to see faces we remember and love and maybe haven't seen all year and to give joy to everyone. And it's for other people too. Those who watch our service, some of them just learning to love Jesus. It's another way this Christmas that we can share his good news and tell others all about him. Our reading is from Isaiah 
9 verses 1 to 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future he will honour Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Maiden's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, established and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Amen. Well, could I thank uh, the team, before we go any further, who decorated the church for uh, Christmas on Tuesday evening during the past week on a freezing cold night here in church. Uh, they were here setting up the tree and getting decorations out, pictures of which you're seeing just as I speak. Uh, I gather there are 1,000 lights on the tree this year, which you can see over my shoulder, uh, which is utterly amazing. So thank you to those for getting uh, the, the church um, ready and, and looking ready for Christmas this year. And of course, that's one of the themes that's in Advent, uh, waiting and, and getting ready for the celebration and the uh, acknowledgement of the birth of Jesus. I don't like waiting, and I don't think waiting particularly likes me. I would be one of those people who, when standing in a queue, would switch to another queue that apparently was going faster, only for it to stop still. I guarantee you that if I were to make the switch five times, five times the queue would stop moving faster than the one I'd just left. Last year, when I arrived at Chiang Mai Airport in Northern Thailand, I entered an immigration hall with perhaps another 400 people. I was one of the last 10 to get my passport seen as I went through passport control. So this week, when I dialed up a customer service number, I did so with a great degree of trepidation. I got through that number pressing game that you play, if you want this, press that, if you want that, press this, and got to the desired place where I wanted to go. And music started playing. And the music played, and played, and played, interspersed with, with little messages telling how sorry they were for keeping me waiting, and then interspersed with other messages telling me that really I'd be better just clearing off and going and sending them an email instead. And so, after just over 20 minutes, I gave up and hung up. I rang the next day, only to be told this time, instantly, to clear away off and go and send an email. Or, if I wanted to wait, I would have to wait for, at that moment currently, and a different voice came in and said, 28 and a half minutes. I hung up. Waiting is not easy. It's not easy at all. And Israel had been waiting. A waiting that now saw them as we arrive in Isaiah, in, in dark times. The nation is marked by really bad government, bad leadership from bad kings. Disobedience, injustice, and idolatry are rife right throughout the, the whole nation. And Isaiah is asked to deliver a very tough message, a very unpopular message, because it's one of judgment. That going against God's ways is going to be at a cost. And that cost will be paid at the hands of the Assyrians and then at a later point, the Babylonians. In chapter 7, he brings this message to King Ahaz. Yet, his message isn't all tough. It's one that is marked by a strong hope. 
the hope for a new king. Isaiah believed very strongly that God was true to his word. Do you believe that, that God is true to his word? Isaiah did, and he believed, even though there was no sign of it, he believed that one day God would send a king as he had promised in 2 Samuel 7, a special king, one that would be different, one that would stand out and do remarkable things. A descendant of King David, whose kingdom himself God would uh, establish, who would be called Emmanuel because he would be God with us, leading Israel into obedience to the commandments and allowing out of them to flow the blessings that God had promised to Abraham way back in in Genesis chapter 12, that God would restore all people to himself. But by the time the wait for this special king reaches Isaiah, the mood music appears to be getting worse as one king after another reigns on David's throne, usually doing a bad job, sometimes doing a very bad job, and occasionally doing an utterly terrible job. None of them had crushed the serpent's head, as God had said in Genesis 3. None of them had brought peace, justice, and a new Jerusalem. And all of them had died, proving that none of them were going to establish this throne and reign over it forever and ever. Which makes Isaiah's hope all the more remarkable. He looks forward in hope to the coming of this new king. He believes this individual will arrive. And what he says about this king, well, it would have raised eyebrows, particularly among the, uh, the peoples who were used to leaders demonstrating their leadership by flexing their muscles and exercising their power. Because Isaiah says this special king will be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, but he would be a child. He would be everlasting father, prince of peace, but a newborn baby. One who would at the same time be both fully God and fully human. And as Christians, we believe that this promise was fulfilled in Jesus a child who would become a wonderful counsellor. Matthew 8, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching as one who had authority, who was mighty God. Colossians 2, in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. A newborn baby who would come to personify God the everlasting Father. John 14, anyone who has seen seen me has seen the Father, Jesus speaking and Prince of Peace. Romans chapter 5, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus was this special king, not only promised, not only uh, interpreted, but also affirmed by, by those who either saw him or who experienced his blessing in their lives. He is going to make all things new. He is going to bring a new kingdom marked by justice and righteousness. Now, what does all this mean for us? Well, you see, the serpent's lie seeks to undermine Jesus. How could he be both human and divine? How do you do that? Why did he have to be human at all? Why didn't he just wave his hand in heaven and everything would be sorted out? No need for him to come down here. See, the serpent wants us to sense that there's a disconnect between us and God. That he actually doesn't really care about us. How could he possibly know what it's like for us to be human? And how would he ever know how sweet it feels to initially go against God's ways? He wants us to see and to think about the notion of Jesus as God and man at the same time as incredible. And by that I mean the accurate meaning of that word, that it has no credibility at all, that it's impossible, it's a fantasy, it's not true. And even if it was, why on earth would he be interested in you and your tiny life 
compared to what what he is and, and what he uh, deals with. God's answer in the Christmas story is the complete reverse of that. The Christmas story tells us that God is so committed to us that he comes as that newborn child. Philippians 2, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. He entered into our world and he entered into our world with the task of rescuing us to himself, to search us out and find us and bring us home, like in the prodigal uh, son, like in the lost sheep, like in the lost coin. Ezekiel 34, 11, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. And in doing that, in walking on the ground, in being among people, in being a human being himself, he got an understanding of us. Not that he didn't already have one because the psalmist has already written that as mighty God, everlasting Father, he already fully understood us because he had made us and knew everything about us. But in his birth, in walking in this world, in breathing our air, in living the life that we live, he had another level of understanding as one of us. He knows what it's like to be, well, take your pick. He knows what it's like to be poor, to be vulnerable, to have to work hard, to laugh, to love, to lose, to be unpopular, to be popular, to be disappointed, to be gossiped about, to be tempted, to be let down, to be hurt, and to die. And to take our place. He really did have to be one of us. He really had to understand um, the power of temptation, the, the, the drive within us to sometimes go against God's ways, to do our own thing. He had to understand that and what is required to overcome that. And the great thing that has come out of that is that he really was one of us and therefore he can identify with us. And you can talk to him about anything, anything, anything that's going on in your life and he understands. Hebrews 4.15 He understands our weaknesses for he faced all of the same testings we do. Whilst he was God, he was also human. Acts 2, 36. This is what Peter, who saw him up close and firsthand, said. God has made this Jesus both Lord, that is, that is effectively him saying, God and Messiah, the special rescuer, the special king who understands us. We're not only dealing with one who knows everything about us simply because he's God and knows all things, but more specifically, because he has lived the same life as we live. He has been here. He understands. But the understanding goes even further than that. Having been fully human and being fully God, he understands that we therefore cannot make our peace with God in our own strength any more than a drowning man can lift himself out of the water. We don't have the ability to take our sins away. You know, sometimes what we try and do is uh, almost like scales, we try and equal up the, the balance of, of the scales or even tilt them a bit in favour of good again. But we realise we can only do that for a certain amount of time and then plunk, we've loaded in a whole more of wrong and bad again. We don't have the ability to take our sins away. But Jesus does. Because he was a human. The child who was born. The son who was given. He can truly stand in our place and represent us as a sinless human being. And as God, 
He has the power to overcome the consequences of sin, that being death. And he understood that his intervention was vital, that without that, we as people were lost. So what do we do about all of this? Jesus is the king who understands. That's what we're underlining. That's, that's what we're saying today. Jesus is that king who understands. He knows us totally, completely. He knows who we really are when no one else is around. He knows what we're like. He knows what makes us tick. He knows what we want. And he knows what we need. For us, he gave everything. Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. The big question actually is, do we understand that? Do we understand that he wants us to place our trust in him, accepting that he knows what we must do so that this new kingdom becomes our new kingdom also? So what does Jesus say to us at Christmas time? as we think about these things, as we think about fulfillments of promise, as we think about him being that king who understands, the one whom Isaiah looked forward to with great faith centuries and centuries before the birth ever happened. Well, Jesus seeks that we simply follow as others followed him when he was here. He said, come, follow me. Because he understands exactly that that is specifically all that we need. The king who understands, he understands you. You can trust him on that. Amen. And now our prayers of intercession are going to be led for us by Stephen Hamilton. And then after that, we have our second song, How Suddenly a Baby Cries. Amen. Father, Lord, we give thanks for this day, for the breaking of dawn to the setting sun. Lord, you tell us that each day is ordained for each of us, written in your book, even before one of us came to be. How wonderful a thought, if we just take time to ponder it. Lord, help each of us to take time to see and wonder at the beauty of the world around us, to appreciate what's on our own doorstep. Let us rejoice in the here and now, not looking to the past, but to the future, a bright and exciting future, one that you have ordained and planned for each of us. Help us to always see the positives in all that we do, the people we meet, the situations we find ourselves in. Too often we are bombarded by all that is negative or bad in our world. Help us, your people, to stand out, to be a light to those around us. Father, we pray for the lonely, the sick and the vulnerable in our community. Sustain the needs of your people as they cry out. We pray for those developing countries who are on top of continuing poverty, lack of basic facilities, cramped living conditions and access to medical help, or having to cope with the COVID virus too. We give thanks for the new vaccines to fight this virus, and we pray that the distribution of these will be fairly and transparently managed, so that nations and communities who need them most won't be the last to obtain them due to greed and corruption. As we approach Christmas, we remember those close to us who have lost loved ones this year. We particularly think of those who may be facing an even lonelier Christmas this year. We pray that you would be close to and comfort them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
changed through history soul by soul have come to find his healing grace he filled my troubled heart with peace with hope of endless work my voice will join the song of praise that tells the And the blessing. May he who is the wonderful counsellor guide you into all wisdom. May he who is the mighty God watch over you and bless you in every way. May he who is the eternal Father provide for you and protect you. And may he who is the Prince of Peace bring the peace of God which transcends all understanding into your hearts this day. And may the gr grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we give thanks for this day, for the breaking of dawn to the setting sun. Lord, you tell us that each day is ordained for each of us written in your book even before one of us came to be. How wonderful a thought, if we just take time to ponder it. Lord, help each of us to take time to see and wonder at the beauty of the world around us, to appreciate what's on our own doorstep. Let us rejoice in the here and now, not looking to the past, but to the future, a bright and exciting future, one that you have ordained and planned for each of us. Help us to always see the positives in all that we do, the people we meet, the situations we find ourselves in. Too often we are bombarded by all that is negative or bad in our world. Help us, your people, to stand out, to be a light to those around us. Father, we pray for the lonely, the sick and the vulnerable in our community. Sustain the needs of your people as they cry out. We pray for those developing countries who are on top of continuing poverty, lack of basic facilities, cramped living conditions and access to medical help are having to cope with the COVID virus too. We give thanks for the new vaccines to fight this virus and we pray that the distribution of these will be fairly and transparently managed so that nations and communities who need them most won't be the last to obtain them due to greed and corruption. As we approach Christmas, we remember those close to us who have lost loved ones this year. We particularly think of those who may be facing an even lonelier Christmas this year. We pray that you would be close to and comfort them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.